What's up, everyone? We're here for a pre-game one playoff podcast. Buck, Bucks and the Bulls still a couple of days away here, but we're going to get into this in depth. There's plenty to talk about matchups, star players, all those types of things. Uh, the Bucks go in heavy favorites, but uh, it could be an interesting series. So let's get started. You are locked on Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Box. I'm your host, Kane Pittman. You can see and hear me on this show daily and find my work over at ESPN. Joining me, the founder of BrewHoop.com and longtime voice of the podcast, Frank Madden. Of course, uh, we thank you for making Locked On Box your first listen of every day or your first watch of every day if you're uh, someone on YouTube right now. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. And uh, Frank, as we get going today, I should a little programming note. So we had Jim Paschke on the show yesterday, longtime voice of the TV Bucks. Uh, so if you missed that podcast, make sure you jump in and listen to that. And just an hour before we're recording this, I jumped on with the guys from Locked On Bulls as well. So. Uh, for the weekend before game one, uh, there's a few podcasts uh, there for you to check out. And uh, bad news uh, for Jim, uh, Frank, is that after we finished recording yesterday, he said, uh, let me know anytime you want me to come on the podcast and I'm ready to go through the playoffs. And I told him that he would probably regret that decision. But we love it. We love any time you get to hang out with Jim. He's, I mean, one of the great you know, ambassadors for, for this franchise. And I think people have probably heard me say probably, you know, last year when his retirement was announced, I'm sure we talked about this, but um, he he was the first person from the Bucks organization that I ever really got to know. And in 2007, before brew hoop even existed, I was literally using a blogger site, which I don't even know if people remember blogger, but it was basically a Google uh, website for, you know, people just like self publish their own blogs. And, um, I think in that summer of 2007, I just started writing random stuff about the Bucks. It was a very eventful summer, people may recall, 2007. Mm-hmm. That was the draft of EGM the end, the Charlie Bell free agency saga. Very stupid uh, in hindsight, very like stupid and trivial kind of like interesting things, I guess, in the grand scheme of the universe. But um, but uh, Kelly Dwyer, who of course still uh, is doing awesome stuff with the second arrangement. Kelly and Henry Abbott, Henry Abbott, of course, True Hoop, Kelly Dwyer, like guest sort of edited true hoop a couple times that summer and they had daily links and they linked to a couple of things I wrote and um, Jim, I guess, I think he might've found it like through that way. Cause this is pre Twitter, right? Like, you know, how do you find things? Um, and as Jim alluded to in your conversation, I mean, he read everything. Right. And so, you know, me being just some random guy writing about the bucks <laughs> um, is still, you know, I, I guess, uh, you know, Jim was was keeping his eyes peeled for everything and read some of my stuff and um, kind of through a friend of a friend um, was able to connect with him and met him. I think it must have been fall of 2007 when they were at a game in Boston where I was living at the time. And, um, you know, we just would always keep in touch, um, catch up over in Vegas whenever I was there for, for Summer League. And he did a number of did a bunch of Q&As with us at Brew Hoop when we were, you know, just nobody's me and Alex Boder. And so, um, yeah, I mean, again, uh, when we talked about it with Dan Smichak and kind of how he was supportive of, you know, us when we were writing and, you know, you talked about your stories with Dan and, um, and Jim's just another person who, you know, was very open to new types of people writing about the team and, um, adding kind of a voice to, to sort of the, I guess it, you know, wasn't the Bucks Twitter verse, but, you know, sort of that, that Bucks internet universe there in the early days. So um always really appreciated jim's kindness and generosity with his time and openness to us and um so yeah uh very cool that that uh he he came back yesterday and obviously just i mean the the honest the honest the t-shirt thing after game six it just i mean just just another kind of piece of the story of last year which kind of just like ties everything together in a really cool and meaningful way you know when you just think about everything that you know, the fabric of the franchise and the fans and people like Jim and, you know, how everything came together and then coming back for ring night, just uh, obviously just a really cool, cool part of, of uh, 
just the, the most incredible year in, in franchise history. Well, like Jim mentioned, uh, that was last year. And now they're about to start another run. And the Bulls, yeah, I mean, we've been talking this about this as a potential playoff series for a lot of the season because the Bulls obviously started so well. But if you look at the season series, the Bucks won at four and zero. The average winning margin, which did blow out, there was a 28 point win and a 21 point win. A couple of the other games were a little bit closer, but overall, the average winning margin around 15 points. The Bucks are 14 and one against the Bulls since Mike Budenholzer came to town. And the one win, there was no Giannis, there was no Middleton, there was no Drew Holiday, there was no Brook Lopez, there was no PJ Tucker. No one played, and the Bulls were able to eke out a win. So that's the only time they've beaten the Bucks. So it's been a long, long, oh, long Elijah time. Bryant. Elijah Bryant scored his 16 points, his his 16 regular season points in his only game in the regular season as a Buck. The magical Elijah Bryant night, and I think Jordan War did Jordan War yeah. score 30 that night. He had a big night too. Yes. But yes, what a that's... magical night it was for the Chicago Bulls. Well, that's right. So I mean that that. That is just the dominance of, of this season series or these two teams over the last regular seasons. But what is the first thing you think about when you think about this series and uh, obviously game one coming up on Sunday? Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting, right? I mean, the proximity of the cities, obviously, I, I expect there's going to be a vocal Bulls contingent because there <laughs> historically has been. Hopefully, Bucks fans get use that as motivation to be loud. <laughs> um I feel like it's it's been interesting. It's almost like I, the, the Bulls, the games in Chicago this year never felt, on TV at least, they didn't really feel like difficult atmospheres. And maybe that's just because the Bulls or the Bucks kind of led really for the vast majority of those games other than that one third quarter in the third game of the season series where the Bulls went on a bit of a run, the crowd got into it a little bit. But it's it, it's it'll be interesting to see what the dynamic is like on Sunday. And I would say that you know my attitude kind of going into it is, yeah, I mean, again, uh, you look at just the, the the way that these teams played, especially the second, you know, kind of half of the season there, um, and the Bucks dealing or the Bulls dealing with the injuries, and then even when they got healthy, just never really rekindling kind of the defensive um, success they had early in the season, um, and and offensively as well, the formula often just n- not kind of bleeding to, I would say, you know, a, a greater than at some of its parts later in the season where the jump shooting dependency, mid-range dependency, especially against the Bucks in those last couple of games, which really didn't serve, seem to serve them well. Um, you know, I feel like this game, this series feels like, yeah, it's, is it a five-game series, right? I'm sure a lot of people want to say like, oh, they're Buc- Buc- Bucks are going to sweep. Um, I think game one is really important for a few different reasons. I think one, um, you've beaten this team four times. And if you let them steal game one, a, then they technically have home court, right? Because they're on the road. B, you breathe life into a team that has obviously been on the back foot for a while now and give them some belief that they can do this. Um, and I think just for the Bucks, I mean, the game ones, you know, as you guys, I think as you alluded to the other day and which we've talked about in the past, game ones have been the soft spot for the Bucks in these playoff series. And it, it's not just last year either right i mean you go back to the first run with bud Orlando. um they they you know they obviously killed the pistons but then they had that horrible performance against the boston celtics in game one of the second round series they ended up pulling one out in the first round of the, the east finals against toronto but that was not easy brooke lopez had to really go nuts and then the next year yeah orlando surprises them in game one of the first round which you know nick vucevic our dear friend had an awesome performance in that game. He was great in that series, has had some real struggles in the second half of this season. And obviously Miami was all over them in the second game there. And then last year, you said it, the only game one that they won was the first round against Miami. And that required an overtime buzzer, essentially almost a buzzer beater. So um, so I think to me, this is a really interesting litmus test of sort of, is it going to be the Bucks suffering from the same old, you know, first game, getting out of the mud problems or do they come out and actually assert what they're capable of? And so I I'm, I'm really fascinated by the first game, not because I think this is going to be, you know, a seven game drag out series. It shouldn't be. Um, but you can't underestimate your opponent in any series. And especially when you've got a couple teams that I mean, there's obviously some history with some chippiness here. There's the local rivalry. Um, there's a lot of subplots to this. And I think if you're the Bucks, you want to 
kind of kill the Bucks, or sorry, kill the Bulls um, spirit, you know, in those first two games. And again, sort of reassert like, hey, we beat you four times and we got better against you as the season went on. Even when you guys got healthy at the end of the season, we kicked your ass anyway. And so we're going to do it again. And this is going to be a short series. So, you know, it's not like the Bucks have to win the first game to win the series. Um, but I think looking at their history, it's a game you really want to see them come out and play well, because to me, that would show at least a little bit of growth as well as they played last year in the playoffs. That was obviously an, an area of concern, just the fact that whether, you know, first games of series, especially when they had layoffs and we saw it this year too, it just feels like this Bucks team when they have a long layoff, they don't come in sharp, even though they're rested. Well, I think that's the interesting thing. And that, again, even though it was only a couple of days, that's why I thought, again, if we go back to last week, that they wouldn't play the back-to-back. Maybe they'd just have one last run in the last game of the regular season because you've got well over a week. These guys wouldn't have played for well over a week, which is obviously unusual. And the first time they've had to do that in, I guess, the All-Star break, but it doesn't happen very often. And there's lots of things that come into play there. And uh, they're practicing, which they also don't practice a lot during the regular season, but they're not playing games. Uh, and I always, I always think about the diet stuff. What are they eating? Are they eating their built Bars? And this is very important heading into a game one against the Chicago Bulls. Now, it's not a day game. So sleep doesn't matter so much, but diet definitely does. And that's why they should be eating the built Bars. And that's why the fans should be eating the built Bars as well, particularly if you plan on uh, getting out to the Deer District. We'll talk about the Deer District in a second. Uh, but you got to have food in the belly. And built Bar is uh, definitely a solution for you. The best tasting protein bar that's ever been made. All the bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Uh, that includes the Puffs, which is like a marshmallow-infused built bar. It's uh, it's delicious, I have to tell you. And, uh, you know, I like the coconut built bars, but there's mint brownie, uh, cookies and cream. Go to built.com. You'll be able to check out all the flavors there. And they're always got new flavors coming up as well. So keep an eye on built.com. These bars are healthy for you and taste delicious. Just use the promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Uh, Frank, what have you got for us? What's going on in the Deer District? Uh, I missed out on last year's festivities, <laughs> but I'm sure it's going to be chaos again. Yeah, well, um, so I th- you guys have probably seen it. There are a number of different sites out that, you know, kind of folks on Twitter have been running promotions. Bucks have been really pushing um, this Deer District VIP um, promotion kind of pass. Um, they're calling it an NFT. Don't be scared by that. It's basically, you know, a, a membership you get on your app, um, and then you can get things like access. Probably most importantly, access to a VIP viewing area uh, for Deer District watch parties. Which I don't know if the Deer District watch parties are going to be as big this year as they were last year, but uh, you know, getting a, a, a you know a, a VIP access to that sounds pretty pretty damn appealing. Um, it's you and a guest get have, have access with this. And then you also get discounts um, at select uh, establishments in the Deer District, food and beverage uh, discounts, things like that. So there's no real downside and it's free. Um, They did a promotion already where they gave out free ones. That's now closed. Um, So there's only, you know, a few of these floating around through some of these giveaways. They gave us 10 of these freebies to give away. Um, There's no real strings attached. Again, you can call it an NFT. It's a cool thing on your phone. Um, but you know, you don't have to pay money for it. So it's, it's good free NFTs. That's harmless, right? That's cool. Um, so what we're going to do is, um, you guys, if you're on Twitter, you've probably seen like different people tweeting about it. Um, I'll tweet out sort of some details after, uh, this show goes up so that you can, um, you kind of enter, let us know if you want one of these via that way, we'll pick, uh, we'll pick 10 winners. Uh, but also for our offline friends who are not on Twitter, you're probably on the internet. You're going to need to be on the internet to reclaim one of these <laughs> codes. Uh, but if you are not a Twitter person and you just want to use um, the old reliable email, you can email us at lockdownbucks at gmail.com. And again, um, these will get you into, uh, give you some real cool perks in the Deer District, which obviously no better time than right now to uh, to get some perks in the Deer District, given that we have the playoffs coming up. So um you can learn more at allaccess.deerdistrict.com. That has kind of the details on it. And if you do win one of our passes, you'll need to just go there and, and drop in the code and uh, and be able to to get everything uh, hooked up on your phone and everything. But um, but yeah, allaccess.deerdistrict.com. And I think the Twitter handle, if you want to check out the Twitter handle, I believe is 
uh, Deer District, I think Deer District VIP um, on Twitter. Yeah, at Deer District VIP. So we'll tweet out some more, but if you're interested and you want that sweet, sweet VIP access, and then let's be honest, Kane, all listeners of Locked On Bucks our VIPs in our hearts uh, and 10 of you can can become VIPs in the tier district as well. So, uh, so yeah, shoot us an email at lockdownbucks at Gmail or check it out on Twitter and we'll, we'll tweet out some more afterwards. All right, let's talk to Marta Rosen. So we know the points that he's put up 28 points per game so far this season. He's been pretty efficient. Doesn't shoot too many threes, but funnily enough, he's actually 35%, even though he only gets up around two per game. The reason why I would have, and not concerned for the series, but the reason why I would feel a little bit apprehensive about some of the players that the Bulls have if these games become dragged out, close games in the fourth quarter, is that because we have seen time and time and time again this season that DeRozan has been able to do some ridiculous stuff in the clutch. So he scored 157 points in the clutch this season. It was only just behind Joel Embiid, who was at 158. Just He was ridiculously efficient, 46 of 86 from the field. Got to the free throw line a lot, which is something that Mike Budenholz has been talking about in the last couple of days, trying to keep him off the free throw line. 71 free throw attempts in the clutch as well, which was number one across the entire league. And then I guess from a broader perspective, if you consider tightly contested shots, and this is via the tracking data on NBA.com, 506 of 993 from the field, 51% when he's got a guy right in his jersey. And this is, this is, the, this is the thing. Look, a lot of the times, and, and I think back to a series like last year against Miami and perhaps even a Miami team this year, and I'm like, well, if it's a close game, I mean, yeah, someone can hit shots, but they don't have they don't have a closer. It doesn't feel like they have a closer. Chicago does have a closer. If they're close enough in the fourth quarter, the Bucs are probably going to have to do work to win these games. And I think that at least gives the Bulls a chance to win a game or two here. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think the Bud and the company have talked about. It. I mean, I think the big priority with him is, you know, you can't take away his, his mid range game entirely. Yeah. It's again, you just try to contest it, show him bodies. He's a good passer, so you can't just you know double triple team him, and that's you know he'll 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 be able to make good reads. Um, but I think the big thing is keep him away from the rim, which obviously is the Bucks' mo anyway. And then don't don't go for his his tricks for getting to the foul line. The first game game these played, big reason why. Was, were kept it within four was because DeRozan went to the line 18 times, <laughs> shot 17 of 18 from the free throw line. The the two middle games, he shot five free throws and zero free throws. And in that second game, he was 11 of 30 from the field with, I think, zero free throw. Was it that game zero? No, I think he that was when he had five free throws. But then the, the next game, he, he didn't shoot a single free throw. So, um, so yeah, I think that's the the big challenge for the Bucks is how do you avoid fouling? Um, you know, it kind of makes me think back to last year's first round against uh, the Heat, where you had Jimmy Butler, who also was not a guy that wanted to shoot threes. I mean, DeRozan's been a much better three-point shooter than Jimmy's been the last couple of years. I mean, DeMar was at 35% this year, so he just doesn't shoot a lot of them. Um, but both those guys like to work in the mid-range, like to kind of bully a bit um, and draw fouls, and they're just very savvy. And obviously, I'm not going to expect that we're going to see the bull or the bucks shut down DeMar DeRozan like they did Jimmy Butler yeah. uh, last year. But, you know, I think you need to have sort of a similar level of discipline and then just attention to detail because certainly he's been the the engine of that offense. And um, when he's slowed, obviously you're going to feel way better about your ability to slow that team down because, you know, they don't shoot many threes at all. Um, and again, I, that, that to me is one of the things that, makes them a lot less scary because we know the Bucks can, I think, keep them from the, from the rim in the half court, especially with Brooke back now. Um, and so with a lot of teams that sort of galvanizes them to shoot tons of threes and that becomes then just the, you know, like we kind of always say, okay, then it just becomes a referendum on who has the better three point shooting night with the bulls. Obviously a lot of those shots that other teams would use turn into threes become mid range jump shots. And as good as DeMar DeRozan is, um, you know, even a 50%, mid-range shooter is only a 33% three-point shooter by, you know, in terms of effective field goal percentage. So, um, so yeah, I think again, easier said than done, but it's going to be on, you know, Wes, Drew, Chris, Giannis at times. Um, They're going to have to just figure out, you know, and again, I think when they were playing them well, they did a good job. They oftentimes even went under some screens at the three-point line 
and kind of said, all right, we know you don't really want to shoot a three. So we're going to go under a little bit and try to build that wall kind of right at the foul line and make sure that we kind of keep, keep arms up and, and don't make it easy for you to get to that spot and don't foul you. And again, if, if they can keep them off the line, to me, that's probably the most important thing. Cause again, it's just really hard for a jump, a mid range jump shooter to kill you if he's purely just shooting jump shots from, you know, 15 feet and out. So we'll see. Um, Obviously, they won four times, so they were able to manage it, even with DeMar having a couple of big games. Um, but to me, that's where it starts. And um, I, I think we never really saw us kind of, kind of peak Zach Levine. You cross your fingers that we won't in the playoffs. You know, the knee injury seems to be affecting him. And we'll see. He's got to have it reevaluated during the summer. But he's obviously also another guy who can be, you know, he's a great shooter, skilled guy and certainly can get to the rim when he's feeling right. And we'll just see kind of where he is physically. I'm sure the week off probably helps a guy like him. So first possession, game one, what do you think the first plan is? I I was talking to some people a few days ago and they didn't totally agree with me, but my assumption was that you'd see Wes on DeMar DeRozan. He's, as you sort of pointed to, I feel like he's a little bit more physical. And then I think Drew would be on Zach Levine, who maybe is on the perimeter a little bit more. That would be my first guess. Uh, How do you feel? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Wes is, um, I would say we- put Wes on guys who want to sort of bully and shoot yeah. jump shots, you know, like Wes versus um, DeMar or KD um, and guys who are more of those like, dr- th- you know, threats to drive. I would probably favor Luca or <laughs> favor Luca. I was thinking of Luca because Luca gave. I'll tell West you what, if Bill, Doza, if Bill Doza gets the job, I will be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Luka Doncic really ate Wes up and just, you know, again, he's yeah. so good at getting to the getting to the paint. Um, but I, I yeah, I would guess put Wes on DeMar because that's the guy you're gonna have to work the most against. And then I think you'll see Drew on DeMar certainly during the game and and that very well may be the option down the stretch if they feel like Wes isn't isn't competing, isn't able to, you know, physically keep up with him well enough. But at a minimum, you know, again, Wes will be kind of the the guy who has to just eat those innings and allow Drew and, and Chris to, you know, not tire themselves out on the defensive end so much. I I think I thought you were going to say, like, well, what are they going to play? What's the first kind of, you know, play that they're going to run oh, from the bull side? This is nice one. I, I, I'm, I'm very curious what they do if they try to get Vucevic involved early. You know, we've seen him have some real, I mean, he's had a tough season overall. I kind of wonder, are they going to try to get him some looks like some pick and pop, especially with Brooke back? Um, you know, you're going to be able to get some jump shot looks against him. We saw it two years ago when Booch was in Orlando. He had a really great series shooting the ball. And that's obviously to me is an X factor. We talk about the Bulls not shooting a lot of threes. I mean, they have a, a center who can do that, but it just, you know, consistency wise, it's obviously been a, a bit of a challenging year for Vooch. So I think he's definitely one of those guys that, you know, if, if, if the Bulls are going to be competitive in the series, they obviously need a a much better version of Vucevic than we've seen in, in a number of the games versus the Bucks this year. Yeah, and quite honestly, just looking back at, at some of the box scores a little bit earlier, he's had a couple of decent shooting games, efficient shooting games uh, this year as well. And and Brook Lopez wasn't always a part of those, but I, I do think yeah, part of that is, as you said, the Bucks are going to give away above the break stuff. And that's kind of what where Vooch likes to hang out, particularly with those mid ranges as well. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see whether what damage he can do offensively because if he's not doing any damage offensively, then you feel like you're probably pretty okay with him on the floor. Uh, our friends at betonline.net have got the odds up for this one, Frank. And right now, as I look at it, the Bulls plus 750 for the series, the Bucks minus 1200. Uh, the Bucks did open up at minus 900. So that's uh, they're strengthening as favorites in the betting markets, but there's plenty of different props, odds, and all type of stuff you can find over at betonline.net for this series and the rest of the series. And uh, maybe you want to get on baseball as well. I'm sure there's some listeners listening to us today or watching us today, Frank, with a headache after the Brewers' uh, home opener. Uh, but I-, I saw the weather in Milwaukee, and quite honestly, I'm just happy if none of you, like your grill got blown into the sky or something like that because it looked pretty dangerous out there. But you can get baseball odds as well at betonline.net. It's a continued source for all the sports wagering information you need. From live betting, playoffs, esports, and more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. It's Bet Online where the game starts. Oh, 
I was doing an ad read and we've come back and Frank's got a Brewers cap on. They did win, did they not? They did. I mean, when the Brewers score a run, they, they, they're very difficult to beat. I think they're four and one when they score a run. The problem is they've gotten been shut out twice. Um, but, you know, you got great, great gear. Brewers have great gear. Great colors. It's early beautiful. season. Hope springs eternal. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll cross my fingers. I'm obviously not as invested in the Brewers. So, hey, anything's great. Anything can, can be gravy this year. No, I love, like I said, mentioned the other day, uh, Oakland fan, but I love the Brewers and I love going to the uh, to Miller Park or AmFam Family Field or whatever the hell they call it right now. Miller Park to me. But anyway, I'll be back out there at some point, maybe this summer. Uh, the other area of the game, and again, look, we've spoken about the Bucks three-point shooting. That's on watch in this series. Can the Bucs start the playoffs knocking down some threes? Because let's be honest, it's been a multiple year thing where they haven't been able to hit threes. But I think where everyone looks at this series and says, okay, uh, this is why we don't think the Bucs can uh, be beaten in the series. One is Giannis. But I think two is just the general size right across the floor. The last time the Bucs played the Bulls, they just looked absolutely enormous at every single position. And as we pointed to, if your answer for the Bulls is to go big man lineups with Tristan Thompson and Nikola Vucevic, I kind of like it for the Bucs. And overall on the season, the Bulls, despite DeMar DeRozan and Levine, these guys that can get to the free throw line a little bit, they're 19th in points in the paint, but then they're 22nd for opposition points in the paint, which seems like a bad ratio if you're coming up against the Bucs, a team that the last time they played, I think the paint points was 58 to 34 or something absolutely dominant like that. So that looks like an area of major concern for the Bulls. Yeah, I mean, they're you know you look at their shot defensive shot chart. It's kind of the opposite of the Bucks in the sense that they I think were were second at preventing opponent three point attempts in terms of like the share of total field goals, um, and then they were dead last in terms of the share of shots that happened at the rim. I think there were about like thirty six and a half percent of opponent field goal attempts came at the rim versus the Bucks were at like twenty eight percent. But the flip side, again, this is kind of like the whole, you know, call it the, the, I call it the toothpaste tube problem, right? Um, The toothpaste has to go somewhere. So everybody wants to force people to shoot mid-rangers, but you can only do that so much. Um, Obviously, the Bulls will happily take lots of mid-range jump shots. um, But if you squeeze that tube, the Bucks, obviously, they prefer to squeeze it such that those shots go to the perimeter, even if that means lots of shots from three-point range. Bucks give up the highest share of shots above the break and overall from three bulls go the opposite direction, right? Bucks were fifth in terms of fewest um, opponent shots at the rim this year. So not, not as good. They've always been like one or two in previous years when Brooke was healthy. Um, So again, you'd expect them to be back towards that level now with, with the size that they have that you mentioned. Um, And, and again, I mean, it's not to say that uh, allowing lots of threes is obviously uh, a guaranteed way to, to win basketball games because it does introduce, I think, more volatility to your defense. And, you know, even with the Bucs, they go 15 and seven after the All-Star break. They were only 20th in defense. The Bulls are 25th. They were pretty bad for the entirety of sort of the second half of the season after a pretty good start. They lose Caruso, they lose Lonzo, and kind of the whole defense really fell apart, which again, not that anybody thought they would be a good defense this year. Um, so I, I think, again, I think, though, it's sort of like now at the point where the Bucks need to prove that like, okay, guys, like, it's cool that, you know, you guys could lock down defensively in fourth quarters and win a bunch of close games against good teams after the All-Star break. But, you know, Bucks had like a plus three net rating after the All-Star break. I mean, they were not like gangbusters here, right? They won a, a lot of games. They played really well in clutch situations. But in terms of like really locking in, I want to see it, right? And again, we talk about game one. How does this team come out? Um Show, show us, right? Show us that like you have flipped the switch and that you are the dominant playoff team that won into NBA championship last year, because, you know, it's always when you say, it's so often with these, with teams, especially that win championships, right? Understandably, you give them the benefit of the doubt all year because they know that it's not about the regular season, but that also means you can kind of find yourself looking over and looking past flaws, which if then they end up losing in the first or second round, it's like, oh, Oh, that was hiding in plain sight all along. We we should have known, right? It's like the you know the the boiling frog problem, right? Like it's it's all gradual, and then at some point the frog's boiled and dead. Um, and he said, "How did that happen?" Well, I mean, 
they didn't really play good defense for most of the year. So we're assuming that they can get back there. Um, and, you know, again, you hope that they can deliver a first round series similar to a year ago when they dominated a heat team that obviously we thought was going to be better than probably we, at this point, relatively speaking, we're ex- are expecting the bulls to be, but you know, this is also a fresh start for them. And, you know, you never know, right? I mean, they probably are saying, Hey, the bucks wanted to play us. Well, F those guys, <laughs> like, Absolutely. let's show them, let's show them that that was a mistake and show them kind of the team that we know we're capable of being. Again, they were a negative point differential team for the season, the Bulls this year. Um, they were 41, you know, whatever, 46 games or 45 games. Um, that was a 500 team, 40, 40 win, 41 win team by point differential. Um, so they have things to prove, but, you know, they have some talent. And I think to me, a lot of this also just comes down to, you know, can guys like Caruso and Ayo Desunmu, can they apply defense enough defensive pressure at the point of attack to really kind of take the Bucks out of, you know, the pick and rolls and the types of offense that they like to run. I don't know. Um, to me, that's something I'm going to be looking out for. How much energy defensively on the perimeter can they come out with? Because I think that was a huge key to when Lonzo and Caruso were doing that at the beginning of the season and really papering over, you know, the fact that you have a guy like Vucevic at the rim and the fact that you are going to give up a lot of shots at the rim and guys like Giannis and Brooks should be able to feast there if they get the ball inside. So um, it should be a really interesting series. But again, I mean, Obviously, I don't know. No surprise. We know who we expect to win. Yeah, and I think hey, when I mentioned the size as well, you automatically think the big guys. But as you just pointed to, yeah, whether it's Dasunmu, uh, Kobe White, uh, even Alex Caruso, in the, some of the last matchups that they played, and he would switch onto a guy like Middleton. Well, Middleton's just like, okay, well, come with me. I'm going to the baseline, and I'm just going to shoot whatever I want, or get into that sort of that spin step back that he has from the free throw line as well. So. I, that and those guys are pesky. There's no doubt, and Caruso will probably come up with a few steals and those those momentum plays that he can come up with. On the defense, it's a lot of the times I've looked at the team and I'm like, okay, well, I understand that the defense isn't where you want to be, but I also think with things like closeouts and three point defense, a lot of it, a lot of it is effort. How hard do they want to try? Because we watched in the fourth quarter where it's like, okay, this team is playing a different level of defense to what we've seen, and they were able to do that in fourth quarters. I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago when it came to to wide open threes, and they're basically exactly where they were last year in terms of giving up wide open threes. But then in the postseason, they cut that down by about eight wide open attempts per game. And it's like, well, why does that happen? Is that just effort? And this is a team saying, okay, it's the playoffs. So we're going to play four quarters of defense. So that's uh, something I'll be watching as well because if they do that again, and all of a sudden you're a couple steps closer to the guy shooting those threes, makes it more difficult you'll have success because as we pointed to, they won a championship last year based on defense. They had some great offensive performances, but ultimately they needed the defense in some of these games, including game one that got everything started as well. So we'll see. Is there anything else, Frank? Anything else you need to get off your chest before we tip? No, let's let's talk Sunday night. Let's see how things go. All right. I mean, Monday lunchtime for me is going to be a rough start to the week if the Bucks don't get off to a win, so hopefully they can. Uh, but as I mentioned at the start, there's plenty of podcasts to listen to to get you through. If you missed any of them, Jim Paschke, the crossover with Locked On Bulls. Uh, so that will keep you going as well. And if you are, if you do want to hear the other side of things, then you can check out Locked On Bulls as well, and I'll have you covered. Uh, Frank, are you? Is this going to be a an annoying weekend for you? Is it going to be a relaxing weekend? Are you overly anxious? Are you just like, yeah, let's just get yeah. to it. Let's just get to it. Wait, you won a championship? You, you, yeah. you, you, your team won the defending champs? Yep, exactly. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. We'll catch you guys after game one. With Frank and myself, have a good weekend. We'll see you then.